Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the sixth uh, session in the series, uh, webinar series Digital Innovation. Uh, yeah, today we are not in the Baumestal uh, studio because of the current uh, corona measures, uh, but uh, today we have a special guest which is uh, Martin Henriks from uh, Bureau Happelt. Welcome uh, Martin. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, glad that you have uh, uh, could uh, join our uh, webinar series. Uh, we are actually um, uh, doing this webinar series because we are uh, seeing a lot of uh, uh, yeah, digital innovation. P people are using new digital techniques in order to uh, uh, get a better project delivery. And uh, we as Baumestal wants to give uh, insight into the current landscape of how, this, uh, how these new digital tools are currently being used and um uh how you actually all uh I, I would, for you it's also uh how it can also be interesting for you to use uh, these kind of tools so uh in order to inspire each other uh we are doing these uh, these webinars or we are hosting these webinars with the uh, what we were and what we want to reach with that is that we as an industry strive forward and uh, continuously de develop in this uh uh, digital innovation uh, aspect. Um, but um, less about the webinar series and more about uh, you, Martin. Uh, who is uh, Martin uh, Hendricks? This guy. Yeah, this guy. Yes. <laughs> no, I am. Um, I'm computational uh, design lead for uh, for Pure Apple. Um, so I. Uh, uh, kind of uh, implement both develop and uh, see to uh, project implementation of computational design in our um, in our European offices. Uh, so that's uh, in Denmark, Germany, Poland, and uh, as of last year, also uh, in uh, in the Netherlands. We just opened um, a uh, pure Hubble office in uh, in Rotterdam last year. Yes, it's really uh, nice that uh, Bureau Apple is also getting. Be is becoming part of the Dutch uh, uh, building industry. So that uh, is a big uh, welcome uh, to Bureau Hoppelt from uh, Baumestal. Um, so uh, yeah, today you will uh, uh, tell a story about uh, POM, which is a, a framework, um, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, but before we do, we still have some uh, house announcements. Uh, if uh, spectators uh, currently uh, joining in, uh, could uh, close their uh, webcam and microphone uh, during uh, Martin's presentation. Uh, that would be better for our internet connection. And uh, at the end of the presentation, you can ask uh, questions in the chat box during the presentation, and we'll cover these at the end. But um, since uh, it's an uh, uh, online uh, event right now, instead of in the Baumestal studio, you can also press the hand signal and uh, raise your hand at the end. And uh, it would be nice to uh, ask your question in person. So if you have a question, raise your hand and then uh, share your screen and your microphone, ask your question in person. And uh, it would be nice if we um, could have some uh, discussion with uh, multiple people uh, about uh, the things that we've uh, learned today. So uh, Martin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Oh, let me just uh, get onto the right screen so I can uh, share. There we go. You should be seeing it now, right? Yes, I see it. Great. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, BHOM, which is a uh, free and open source interoperability framework that we've um, started at uh, Pure Apple. Um, I'll start by talking about the philosophy behind it, like why we did it, what problems are we actually trying to solve here, um, go into a bit of the structure of BHOM and talk about how it is both object oriented and uh, flow based programming. Uh, I'll show a few uh, examples and then at the end I'll make sure to leave some, some time for uh, questions and a discussion. So what are the challenges that we're facing at as an uh, industry? So AEC industry, of course. Uh, one is model complexity. 
So we are creating a huge number of design models. So for some projects, we are creating hundreds of models. And these are not disconnected models, even though they're in different disciplines. These models are very much interconnected so that changes in one model actually affects the, the other models. And we can achieve a lot more if we were to connect these models together and also connect them to the data that really should be uh, driving the design of these, these models. And that drive to uh, design the models uh, can translate into process complexity. So we have these tools that uh, can create intelligent systems. So these processes that actually generate our models. And as these processes become more and more complex, it really becomes more important to ensure that there is clarity in, in these processes. Third level here is really, it's also problem complexity. So the problems that we're trying to solve are growing in, in complexity. So this is both in, in scale and the number of people that are involved, and it really makes it uh, important that these are, uh, are coordinated, another challenge. So we really need a uh, kind of a global collective response to address these uh, huge challenges. And our uh, response to that would be then the BHOM, which stands for Buildings and Habitats Object Model, or just uh, as we, it's a bit of a mouthful to say every time, so we just refer to this as BOM. Um, and the intention behind BOM is to connect everything to everything else. This is the software interoperability that we want to connect. But it is also that we need to make sure that everybody has access to this. So it's also that we want to connect everyone to everything. And because in the end, it's really about connecting the people that are involved in, in solving these problems so they can, can better uh, collaborate on solving bigger and more complex problems. So in really what it is, is an attempt to connect everyone to everyone. Um, so BOM is really about creating a, um, a common language in the digital sense. This is not Esperanto 2.0. Um, and one of the core principles in our attempt to, to create this shared language is really that the code structure is better reflecting how humans think and, and work. So what it is, uh, the bomb consists of um, an object model. So this is the, the data or curated data. Um, is three parts. Second part is an engine. So these these are collections of uh, functions that act upon and change this this data. And the third part is the links to the softwares that we use. These three parts together are what we refer to as a, a bomb toolkit. And we have a lot of these uh, toolkits. So we have over 70 now that are uh, public and, and open source. So uh, adapters of connections to uh, Keras and GSA and Rhino, Grasshopper, Revit, what have you. Um, and you're very welcome to uh, get in touch if you want to uh, help develop these. We also have some internal toolkits, or about 50 of these, that we have not yet uh, open sourced. Um, before we open source, we need to do a lot of quality assurance to make sure that it's uh, it's good enough for public viewing. Um, so, and the ones kind of highlighted here are toolkits that we are very close to uh, open sourcing and, and will become available soon. So again, if you're interested in any of these, that you're very welcome to um, get in touch if you want to collaborate. So let's look at that first part of the uh, adapters, uh, the toolkit, these uh, adapters, which is for uh, linking software together to get these to talk to each other. Um, this is for moving data between applications, which in the end will give us the, the freedom to use the application that is best suited for the task that you need to do. You're not forced to do something in one software that you'd prefer to do in another software. Um, and this is not really something new. I mean, we've been connecting software to each other for, for years. Uh, the problem is how we used to do this. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to connect Rhino to Excel, that you need to write one 
uh, interface using the APIs of those softwares. So connecting everything meant you had to write a lot of these connections. Instead of doing that, our solution is this one common language, making it much simpler to connect one software to each other. So here, if I wanted to connect a uh, Rhino to GSA, it is one link through the bomb, and I would not just have connected Rhino to GSA, I would have connected it to uh, Tecla and Revit and RFM and RAM and Python and all of these 70 uh, toolkits that, that are out there. So it becomes much easier to extend this, uh, this framework. So that is the uh, adapters or how the software speaks to each other. The second part of these toolkits is the uh, the object model. So the data that is, is sent between the softwares. And we've done this quite simply. So the object model is really just the definition of the elements that we use on projects and done in a way that we best understand them. So as an example, this is the code behind a, um, a circle. And all this contains, it's simply just the name of the object, so circle, and it's defining properties. So here it's the, the sensor for the location, normal for the orientation, and a radius for the, the size of it, nothing else. There are no derived properties. These are located in the, in the engine. Um, so if you're a software developer sitting there, you might say, well, Martin, this is not really following the traditional object-oriented programming principles. And this is done intentionally because we want to define these objects more closely to how an engineer would understand these objects rather than how a software developer would understand an object. So for something a bit more relevant for, for us, uh, this is the definition of a beam, what that looks like. Um, and this might look very uh, complex, but if you look at these lines of code, you'll notice that a lot of this is really just the description of what these um, these properties uh, are. So your start node, end node, section properties, orientation angle, supports, and, and what have you. Um, but that's what it looks like in, uh, in code. And you're probably not going to interface with this through, through code. So how to get this in the uh, actual user interface. Um, these are kind of, there's one component to create an object because on that object, you'll have a drop down list to select what it is that you want. So in this case, we wanted to create a bar. You can go through this drop down to find a, a bar. So this is what it looks like on the, uh, on the user interface. And one thing that we've done here is um, make this very easily to, um, to extend. So it's, it's an extensible object where let's say we have uh, written, this is our understanding of this object. And in order to add something to this, you don't even need to go into the code to do that. You can simply add additional properties, properties that didn't originally exist. You can add that onto it and this will become a uh, custom data. So again, don't don't need to go into the code to do this. And a use case example for this might be that, uh, let's say your your beams, you want to add in information about where that particular beam exists in a uh, construction sequence, and you can very easily do that. So the third part of these toolkits then is the engine part where you manipulate these objects, and again. It is, these are only functions that you apply to it. So it's very simple here using the example of that, that circle. It is the put in a, uh, a circle and you will return the, uh, the area. So a, a number here. Um, and we've categorized these uh, functions so that you can create them, you can modify them, you can query, you can compute, or you can convert. Um, for that example of the of the beam again, uh, this is what looks like the code behind it. If you wanted to uh, flip a bar, you will modify that beam and simply, well, flip is just exchanging the start node for the end node and end node to, to start node. Um, but again, the majority of, of probably, I'm expecting people here that they're not going to be uh, 
using uh, BOM with their programming in C sharp, you're not going to be um, designing your whole building while writing a C sharp code. You're going to want to use some uh, graphical user interface like Dynamo or um, or Grasshopper. And BOM has really been created with uh, this flow based programming in mind. So what we've done is that we have basically mapped BOM to uh, these flow based programming environments. And if you are a developer, that means that you get automatic components. This for me is a bit uh, was magical when I did this. And if you have done user interfaces before, this is going to make you smile because you don't need to write all the UI code. You get that for free. So you just write the function or the object definition and you will automatically get both the Grasshopper component, the Excel formula and a Dynamo node. And in the future, if there are more components, these will be uh, functioning in the same way. Um, and this is uh, what that simple UI looks like. Um, one thing here is that, well, I don't know about you, but I was very surprised when somebody referred to Excel as flow-based programming, because to me, flow-based programming is uh, Grasshopper and Dynamo. It's very visual, um, but actually, thinking about it when you write a formula in excel you're referencing um a cell in your in your spreadsheet that is actually a link so that is actually a flow that you're you're creating so excel grasshopper and dynamo are under the uis that we call uh, flow based um these will be a bit slow i can come back to these just the ui in action but just uh, aware of time i'm just going to skip over these uh, for the sake of showing you some examples. Um, so the first example here um, of how you're connecting software to each other, um, you've probably seen many versions of this because by now it's fairly ubiquitous workflow that you are parametrically setting up a, a building, in this case a kind of a standard high rise, maybe mid rise uh, building, and then you're sending this into your uh, analysis program so that you're generating parametrically your building. And then what we are called pushing it to the analysis software or your bin software, it could be. Uh, what we really want to do here is that we, we better, we want to connect uh, better into the design platforms that we're using. So integrating in, in, a, in an ecosystem. And because this is uh, because of the bomb is not dependent on any kind of user interface such as Rhino or, or Grasshopper, it means that we can do this in, in other interfaces, even in Excel. So here we're actually creating a uh, similar building, but using Excel instead. So here we're entering um, the location of, of columns. Um, and then we can push these up into uh, into robot at the top there or into uh, into Revit or into uh, I think ETAPS it says. And it's simply by changing the adapter that this data is uh, is connected to. So this is the power of, of uh, a common language to translate between these uh, packages, which means that you can more easily coordinate between the individuals using these packages. But also if you have a checking engineer using a different software, you can do checking across analysis packages. And once you have created your analysis model, you probably want to uh, look into the, the results. So you can pull back the results from your analysis software into whatever interface you're using. Excel would make a lot of sense for numerical data, of course. Um, so here we are uh, pulling the results in these uh, the nodal reactions from our little test test building, and we can query these as um, as objects. So we can get out the, uh, the here we're looking at the object ID to get that up, and then you can um, query the uh, the individual results. So for example, the I think this was the uh, force in in x direction. Um, and we have this function that that's called explode. Explode just mean is not a disruptive. It is simply showing you what is available to you. So what is it on this object that I pulled in? What are all the properties that that object contains? 
and four more, more um, complex results. Uh, you might not want to visualize this in uh, in Excel. So here, if you have, for example, mesh results, you can uh, pull that those results in and visualize in any uh, 3D capable uh, software that you like. Um, and this actually also includes uh, web services such as uh, 3D repo, if you're familiar with that. And one thing that is uh, often causing problems with um, this workflow of uh, generating analysis models from a parametric software is that once you've cr uh, created it, you don't want to uh, delete it in order to create a new one. When you make changes, you want to just update it. So um, adapters that are the, these adapters are created so that you can update your models in addition to just deleting them. So if you would manually apply properties in, in this case, robots or in your analysis software, you maybe you want to um, set your section sizes. You want to uh, do a bit of section design in, in robot because that makes sense there. You can do that and then still control the geometry parametrically from, from Grasshopper because it makes more sense. It's easier to modify the geometry there and then just keep changing your um, uh, section properties in um, in robot. Um, and zooming out a little bit, so we're here in an, an MEP example. Um, it's not just the typical engineering elements that, that we can uh, push and pull between softwares. It's also uh, geometries such as uh, as meshes. So here, what we're doing is we're um, pulling in the MEP equipment from, from one Revit model. And then you can, in the same uh, interface, you can then select another uh, model, so the structural model, and pull in the, uh, the geometry uh, from that in order to coordinate in, in one environment. Um, and pulled in with this, it's not just the geometry itself, but also the, uh, the properties that have been assigned to that. So, for example, you would have could have the uh, element properties as in the uh, the dot names or any kind of identifying um, identifying names, so you know what is clashing with uh, with each other. And I mean, yes, you could do this in Navis work or or whatever, but in the case where you have a parametrically defined structure you might want to keep the coordination within the same environment where you're parametrically controlling this. So again, it's not a destructive process where you're exporting to something that is uh, that is static. It's here you can see the just tagging it with the identifying uh, property. And it just a fun example. I mean, this does work with any kind of geometry. So just to show you, a, uh, I think we got this from, from BIM store. I think it's called an, an at at from from Star Wars. Uh, so it really does work with kind of any geometry that has a, a mesh representation. You can you can use this uh, with. And going beyond the uh, what has ge uh, geometrical representations, uh, it is also that we want to connect with uh, design data. And often a uh, parametric environment such as Grasshopper is, is a bit disconnected from the data that we want to use there. So we've started to serialize these uh, common data sets and put those into a, a BOM data set. So for example, here we've uh, serialized the sections for US, UK and, and European standards. So all those steel sections and you can easily just load these in using a, uh, a dropdown. So selecting the, the type and those that specific section that, that you need. Uh, this means that you can uh, link data directly into the your design process. Um, and also note that uh, all of this data contains the source so that you can verify that this is the, the correct data. So it's, it's linking to the source of the, your, uh, your data. And this is not just for the structural data. Uh, we have started to also serialize uh, data for embodied carbon. Now, and again, this allows us to, to bring that data directly into the design environment, uh, which 
typically takes a long time if you have to uh, find the data, you have to do lookups to get the correct data sets out of your web interface or a PDF or if people still use physical books. Um, so here you have you have data from I think EC3 and Quartz and DGNB. Um, and this really means that from a very basic early on design, a very rough design, you can start to have a carbon counting uh, included in your um, in your design process. Um, so to give an example of this, uh, this shows just an example of a, of a web interface where so we've brought this into a parametric model, linking this directly to the uh, embodied carbon source. And here using this uh, web viewer to visualize the results so that changes in the model are updated real time in the viewer. And again, I mean, this is done in um, Rhino and Grasshopper, but could just as well be done in uh, in Revit and Dynamo. Um, and what, so you get these real time uh, updates on your design, so informed design decisions. And you could also change the the source of your of your design here. So again, I mean, you could switch between uh, EC3 or Quartz or whatever DGNB uh, is using. So um, in the end, I mean, what this common language really allows you to do is rapid prototyping, but across disciplines with the data that is that is needed for those individual disciplines. So a common shared model that makes data driven design possible uh, across these disciplines, because in the end, it, it's really about making it easier to design better performing build buildings. And that requires uh, rigid collaborations. So at the end, I mean, if you're this is free and open source. So if you want to, uh, if you find this interesting and want to uh, to use it, you can go to uh, bhom.xyz and download the installer. Or if you're feeling uh, adventurous, you can uh, go to uh, github.com and uh, download the uh, the source code from this and build this all from from source or just see how it was done. And that's the end. Great. Thank you, uh, Martin, Martin, for this great. I hear myself uh, echoing, so somebody's sharing your screen. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, great story. Uh, very elaborate and uh, complemented with uh, nice uh, illustrative uh, videos. So I uh, got a, quite a good uh, idea about uh, what you could do with it. And I uh, got also motivated to uh, uh, get some more insights into it. Um, in the meanwhile, I saw uh, Michael van Telge, which is a former uh, presenter of uh, uh, this uh, series. He did the first session. He asked some questions about, um, um, yeah, we can go through them uh, chronologically. Um, or, uh, yeah, Michael, maybe you can ask your, your questions yourself by uh, sharing your screen and uh, sharing your uh, microphone. Uh, if not, I can also uh, read them out loud from uh, uh, text. Uh, so uh, his first question was, uh, how does uh, BHOM compare against uh, Speckle? Is the lie completely different or uh, complementary? Uh, complementary. Um, so, I mean, there is a uh, there is an adapter for Speckle, and we had um, we have talked a lot with uh, Dimitri, the uh, de developer of uh, of Speckle. Um, but I think that one of the differences here is, uh, at least in my perce perception, is that where Speckle is very focused on uh, endpoints, so that's the the sending of the data, it is we are more focused on what is getting sent. So again, this that the data that you're sending is understood and shared and uh, accessible. Where I think Speckle were more focused on don't really care what data it is whatever it is, we can send it from point A to, to point B. Um, I do, I, I didn't include them here, but we actually have some uh, examples that also include Speckle in, in our workflow. So to answer your question very much, I think it's they are complementary. Right. Yeah, I saw it uh, in the, uh, the scheme of the, the circular screen. Uh, Speckle was also uh, uh, in there as an icon. So. Mm -hmm. 
That's nice. Um, but uh, in many, yeah, Speco can also be seen as an, another interoperability platform. And I guess that uh, uh, what, what will happen in the future is that there will be many more interoperability platforms. And uh, it will be uh, come something comparable to the aviation industry, where you have uh, you cannot fly to everywhere from every location because you will have a, a number of flights needed. So you go to a certain hub, like mm -hmm. Schiphol Airport, and then uh, go to uh, London Heathrow, and then go to uh, a smaller uh, city, so uh, so to say. And it looks like this uh, interop uh, interoperability platforms are also creating such a network. Uh, will also be creating such a network that you have, you will be able to reach any destination, but with some, uh, yeah, through some hubs. Yeah, and I th I think one of the just to to add onto onto that I like your metaphor of the uh, the airport the uh, hubs. I think one key thing that both Bomb and Speckle have is that it's open source, the, which means that you want to have changes in it. Yeah, you can do that. You can make it work work for you. And secondly. It is not in a commercial way where if our business does not work, then the functionality disappears. There was a example of that a few years ago with Flux, right? That people were setting up workflows on something that wasn't a viable business behind and then it disappears, which that cannot happen here because it's uh, open source. Yeah. Same yeah, as well, Speckle. Yeah, that's also a really uh, striking difference is that uh, uh, platforms are uh, more open to share uh, information uh, and share their uh, framework, so to say. Uh, but what is actually the philosophy uh, behind that for uh, for uh, Bureau Hoppelt, for instance? Uh, what? what uh, why would you uh, share it open source? Why not sell it and try to make money? For example, what is yeah. the philosophy behind? Well, it? I, I think. I think one thing is that there's yeah okay sure you could make a little money off it but you could probably generate a lot more value by having more people use it and I think it is it is that aspect that we want to as I said in the beginning this philosophy is that we want to solve very large problems very complex problems you cannot do that alone you really need to collaborate and that that does extend beyond your own little uh, your own organization. So the more people that you can in, uh, involve in this, the more expertise you can get into it, the more valuable really it, it becomes. And it's not, uh, if if we were to try and uh, make this a, a commercial product, it would be uh, limiting. I mean, you would be pushing people out from, from using it. Yeah, I totally agree. It, um, and uh, I think that a, a platform like this uh, can serve as a really good backbone in order to uh, create more uh, 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 th that you have something to work together on uh, instead of starting from scratch. Yeah. Um, Michael also asked uh, uh, how much you need to uh, you, you need to know prior before starting to use uh, BHOM. Um. I was I was almost about to say nothing, but that's not completely true. Of course, I mean if you if you know how to use uh, Grasshopper, I think that's pretty much it. Um, if you're if you're comfortable installing a a plugin and using a new plugin in in Grasshopper, then you're already there where you need to be. I mean if you go to that site, there's uh, once you download the installer, there's included some uh, examples for a lot of the, the functionality in there. So I, I think it's very, very easy to um, to get started with. I'd say one thing that might um, confuse in the in the beginning, if, if you're not aware, is how you get this. The, I showed this magic component that once you if you want to use bomb in Grasshopper, you want to uh, create an, an object you might be surprised that uh, that object doesn't have any inputs or, or outputs. So you need to just be aware, you need to right click the component in order to get access to all of this, uh, this functionality. But other than that, I would say the, uh, the learning curve is, uh, is not steep. Okay, that's uh, 
good to hear. Yeah, I find it uh, surprising uh, that that these components uh, mutate if you uh, select a different uh, component. That's uh, quite uh, special. I did not uh, see it, that it, before. It, it is, but one thing that it did. I mean, there is um, there's there are so many functions and and objects in this. I mean, again, because this is cross disciplinary, so everything you can do all. Uh, MEP elements and everything you can do with those elements are there. So you can imagine if we were to have one component for every single function and every single object in there, it, it, the interface would just be completely un, unmanageable. I agree. The nice thing also about this drop down menu is that you immediately see the structure of uh, BHOM, of how, it, um, how all these components are uh, ordered. I'm glad you say that because that is like this whole point about making it more intuitive and more to how engineers understand objects. It is really to make that so that that seems to have at least come come across there quite quite well. I mean, but after a while you're going to be wanting to again because there's so many objects in there, there are so many components that that you can use. Uh, that drop down menu becomes quite big as well. So after a while when you're uh, kind of comfortable with the naming, then you can start searching. So we've made a, a simple, uh, the shortcut is Control Shift B. This is all described on, on the web page, of course, but a, uh, a, a custom uh, search. So normally in Grasshopper, you double click and you can search the components. And there is a sub search for only bomb components um, using that, that shortcut. So you don't have to go through those uh, drop down menus. Understood. I saw uh, a question from Cornet, which was also a question that I had in my mind. Is uh, yeah, you showed uh, these examples, but uh, it was not really uh, uh, known where uh, th this data was stored. Because uh, normally, when you uh, start uh, with your uh, computer, for example, you you store your data at a certain location. But how does this work with uh, BHOM? Is it stored in a in a on a cloud server, or do you? Uh, save your uh, 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 your data on, a, on your C drive or something like that. It is it is stored in there. So when we the data that we have serialized that is stored on on your computer. So that's uh, with every single installation. So you reference that that location uh, every time you create a new project. No. That's that is uh, that is already referenced. So, for example, you want to use uh, sections. Okay, you go through. You click on the section component. You right click. You say structures, uh, steel sections, uh, UK standard, and it's a CHS, and that's it. And how does it um, know it's uh, one project and not the other? Uh, the how's the data uh, between two projects split? You oh, uh, but um, it's not project data. That is as it is with with Grasshopper, the kind of volatile unless you um, um, specify otherwise. But but this data is it is essentially just a very big JSON file that is stored with the the installation. So. If it's specific to your project, it is up to you to decide that, okay, I'm working on a European project, I'll use EU sections, or US project, I'll use US uh, standards. Okay, I saw uh, also a question from uh, Navid, uh, which was about um, how does the uh, uh, version control system work? Uh, can you track changes like uh, in GitHub that you see some uh, uh, that you can uh, do some pull requests or something. Uh, uh, maybe if you work with mul multiple people inside one project that uh, things update over time, that you um, can control your versions. Um, it depends. Oh, by the way, hi, Navid. Um, it depends on, on what you mean. If it's version control in the um, of the code, that is that is all based on uh, on on Git. So there's quite rigorous um, quality assurance and continuous integration processes set up for that. Um, version control otherwise, I'm not sure if I, I understand, but the, the components themselves, I mean, that is your version is the same way that you would normally control your, your Grasshopper script or your Dynamo script. That's, that's up to you to decide. 
there is a uh, actually a component just in case it's the the third um, option what happens when we do updates and there is uh, an option in there where you can upgrade from previous versions and we've made a, a very very big effort to make sure that everything is uh, backwards compatible okay that's uh is it perhaps possible for me to elaborate a bit on the question uh, just to clarify it by yes, the way I, hi, sure hi martin, you can, uh, share uh, your screen. Screen. It's also martin and i used to be a former colleague so it's nice to see him again um i was actually thinking more in terms of uh, project-based data how you consolidate it and keep this idea of a uh, single source of truth because if you have a file that multiple people are pushing changes into it, let's say your Revit file that is now being uh, synchronized with your analysis tool, how do you track all these changes to make sure that everyone in the team is aligned and all, all the cross-disciplinary work is uh, synchronized? Well, if you're talking about inside the Revit environment, I would I would suggest you can do this. This is up to you of how you structure your your project. In in Revit, I would probably use the uh, version control that you are 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 used to and what you've probably uh, specified on your uh, BIM agreements and and so on. On the on the other hand, if you're doing it the um, uh, again, I like you that you mentioned the single source of, of, of truth. It is really to for you to implement that in, in your project. So if you are using Grasshopper uh, to generate your uh, structural model and then to uh, uh, push that back into your, your Revit model and say this is the version, well, I would suggest that you attach a version number to this so that you know you can inspect your elements in, in Revit and see, and, ah, okay, that came from, from this version. Uh, the other thing that this allows, and we, we've done in some um, uh, on some projects, because there are, when you're collaborating with a lot of people, if, if not every single uh, stakeholder on a project is using BOM and we've agreed to do it in a, spe a specific way, then you need to handle these discrepancies in, in workflow and that's another thing that just, uh, well, it becomes easier for you to handle in BOM because you can ascribe certain properties that you can uh, that you can query. So I can't say that there's not, it is not a version control system. You still have to uh, to think and be rigorous in, in the implementation of this. You can use BOM to make that easier for you, but it will not handle it for you, if that makes sense. Understood. Thanks, Martin. You're welcome. So Joey Jansen uh, just uh, raised his hand, but uh, yes, uh, lowered yes. his hand. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> hello. Thank Martin for the presentation. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was more or less the same question because you talked in the presentation at the beginning, connecting everyone to everyone. Um, how do you prevent from everybody uh, working in different software intervening in each other's work? Well, that's uh, one part of that is really when it, because you're bridging softwares, then the people working in different softwares becomes less of a problem. Um, so, uh, and the other part is uh, bridging people's uh, work. Well, that, uh, and to be completely honest, it really depends on the rigor with which you, you work, because I have seen on projects that I have worked on with, with my colleagues, we also need to put in effort to make sure that we have this single source of truth. That's not something that you get for free. It really is your 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 practice and your implementation processes that the, basically your, your workflow that needs to be clear and, and specified. BOM can help, but it cannot do it for you. No, that's, that's clear. Thank you. <laughs> it's more or less uh, you have to work outside of the uh, software. You also have to discuss things and then collaborate in implementing those changes more or less. And absolutely. That's what you put in your workflow, as I understand. Yeah, ab absolutely. There is no, uh, I don't care how uh, how clever AI becomes. There is there is no technological substitution for rigorous thinking. No, that's true. OK, thank you. Great, uh, great addition uh, 
additional explanation, Martin. Uh, <laughs> it all starts with uh, making good uh, agreements with one another and then uh, helping this tool, uh, so to say, to uh, uh, create more efficiency within your work. Uh, in the meanwhile, I saw Teun and uh, Michael uh, asking each other questions about uh, how to download uh, uh, BOM. So uh, it seems that uh, they already uh, started with uh, uh, trying uh, figuring it out. That's great. That's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, great news already. Um, yeah, what I was, uh, what I had as a final uh, remark would be, uh, uh, I guess that uh, PHAOM would be really interesting for uh, graduate uh, graduate students as well, uh, because they will have a really good toolbox in order to, um, which could help them with uh, any um, uh, any uh, research they have to do. Um, so. Um, do you have uh, some advice for uh, for uh, graduate students on how to uh, start uh, using uh, BOOM? Um, no, just start using it. Uh, again, using I think it. the the the, um, the learning curve here is really really not that steep. The the one thing that might be a bit overwhelming is there's just there's so much in there that it might be uh, a bit overwhelming when you first see it. Um, but there is, I mean, there is on the uh, phom.xyz on that web page, there is um, there are samples coming with it. There are descriptions. There are some uh, some tutorials. There's also a um, a Slack channel that you can uh, ask questions to us. We will be migrating that Slack channel into uh, into GitHub, but uh, slowly. But that is uh, currently that is uh, in in Slack. You can ask questions. Um, we have actually uh, had a few collaborations, so supervised a few um, uh, master thesis students at uh, both DTU and uh, uh, the university in uh, Bauhaus in, in Weimar. Um, that also in included uh, bomb in their. Um, in their work, and the feedback from there was not uh, oof. That's that's difficult. It's which I think for a lot of uh, young people, it's very natural to okay. There's a new plugin for Grasshopper. I'll try that out and just start working with it. Oh, it's useful to do this and this and this. So I'll keep working with it. And I think it's the same approach here. Just start start using it. Yeah, that's also nice if they if you keep uh, uh, on discovering new new things and uh, keep. Uh, Continuing uh, with your knowledge of the of the, the framework. Uh, so, uh, if I understood correctly, if if you have any questions, the best uh, uh, platform to go or the best forum to go is to the Slack page of the BHOM. Sure, you are also very welcome to just reach out to uh, to myself or any of my colleagues. But most of them will be uh, also in that Slack channel. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, uh, if there are no not any questions anymore. Uh, we can stop at that point. And uh, Martin, I would sort of like to thank you for your uh, great effort of uh, showing this framework. And um, hopefully, uh, these uh, these guys starting uh, to figure it out will uh, be able to uh, make a complete workflow soon. Uh, I hope framework. so. Thank you very much for for inviting and hosting. Yeah, and we'll uh, see each other probably soon. Hopefully uh, in person. I, I hope so, yeah. Okay, thank you, Martin. Great, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.